Henrik and Daniele talking to us uh, from Workday about how to monitor yourself for free. Well, kind of. Learning is for free in the world. Hey, so this is going to be a two-parter. Uh, I'm going to kick it off. But yeah, so my name is Eric Lee, Senior Network Engineer here at Workday. Daniela, I don't know, sorry, second. Hello. Principal Infrastructure Engineer. We both work for Platform and Infrastructure Organization within Workday. So this is going to be kind of not a serious talk, but kind of. Hang on. Can you hear me now? No. So it's, it's not going to be kind of a serious talk. It's just going to be talking about a journey for myself of building a monitoring tool. And you know, I, I know I'll talk about automation tonight, but for me, I was always told, find a product and try and automate it to you know, see it all the way through. So for me, I'm going to talk about my journey of building a monitoring tool. And then we have Daniela. He's going to talk about 2,000 eyes. I know there's some people from 2,000 eyes here, but we are. Just, just we are, a random name. Yeah, 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 yeah. We are layered up, so it's OK. <laughs> um, but again, just a bit of fun. And a lot of this kind of came out of uh, collaboration. You know, as I said, I'm, seeing network, I'm a network engineer in Daniela's uh, platform. So I'll kick off my part. So building a monitoring tool. So every solution starts as a problem. So, a bit of a bold statement, but you know, when we look at anything that's kind of come through the years, it's kind of started off as a problem, and somebody has to find a solution to get around it. So, what was their, their problem? So, problem in Workday at the time was that the infrastructure was growing so big, um, as Amanda talked about at the start. So, Workday is a SaaS based uh, company, so a lot of our customers were connected over the internet. You know, we offer HR systems, financial systems. So, our customers expected up all the time. So, for us, as our infrastructure grew, you know, we started to scale out bigger and bigger. Our platforms became bigger and bigger. Um, and for us, data protection of our customer data was key, which means we have many security platforms that sit within our infrastructure. So our automation didn't keep up at the time, and a lot of hand, hand bashing or keyboard bashing was still in place. So when somebody would make a change in, a, let's say, a security policy, it was kind of hard to kind of know sometimes whether that worked or not. And for us, your customer being your alerting tool is very bad. You know, some of our customers are ringing in and saying the app is down again. You know, and this is this is terrible. Um, and for us, we'd be sitting there. Yeah, it looks fine to us. You know, all our monitoring tools are cool. Everything's great inside. And they'd be like, No, it's definitely down. And we're like, No, it's not. So we have this back and forward. <laughs> yeah, I'm not painting a good picture here, but. We do have monitoring tools, and we monitor the application so much in the data center, it, it really looks great. But for us, we did have external monitoring, but it only monitors at the edge. It didn't monitor all the way down into the application. So we needed to get better monitoring and verification. So we needed to monitor application all the way down to the stack. And verification against changes. So like I said, an application guy might put in a, a request to open up a certain policy on a firewall or within their SDN network. It would come to the, the, the engineer who would make that change, but the application guy has gone to bed. So we don't know whether the change is, is right or not, and we're going to wait for him to wake up in the morning. So again, we need to get better verification and build tooling around this. So again, it comes back to, do we build or buy? As engineers, we all want to build, but businesses like to buy. So for us, I worked in both scenarios where I worked for a company where they'd happily go out and buy five tools where we could have just built one tool to do this to do this job. So for me, I looked at this and I said, I think we could build it, but I also looked at the vendors that we did have at the time, and we still have them today, and looked what their offerings were. So for me, I said, automation can help. So we talked a bit about automation tonight. This was, for me, a journey into automation, and kind of seeing that uh, for us, we had these, what we call test tenants, or customer uh, testing uh, within each data center. So I thought to myself, Sony's already have doing something like this before. So a simple login against uh, an online application. So I went out to Stack Overflow, as you do, pulled some code off it, worked there and I did it, and then I reached out to Jose, who's one of our dev engineers, and uh, I told him what I was trying to do, and he happily said, laughed at me and said, every journey starts with a step. <laughs> and it did. This journey started with this simple couple of lines of code. So I worked with Jose back and forwards, um, lucky enough he's based in a different time zone, um, and we were able to understand the Workday application. 
um, to a point where we knew testing against the application what to expect for success and what to fail. So this then drove into more collaboration within uh, getting other people involved. So again, know my own limitations. I'm not a coder at the end of the day. There's lots of people around me within Workday that are very familiar with this. So I was getting used to Git and all this uh, coding stuff. And as you can see, I'm not a coder. And for me, I kept on pushing up my credentials, <laughs> open the Git, and Parisa said, stop doing this. There's a way to get around this. <laughs> and again, all learning for me as I went on this journey. So this is our first dashboard. This is what we were able to create. So this is testing against all our data centers. It's just a basic Python uh, script that's going in, doing a login against the actual application. And if it gets a certain regex back, then we say it's success. If it doesn't, it's a fail. So for you code people out there, I'm not sure you get a code. So you see that? Yeah. So this is a simple bit of code. It's probably hurting your eyes. But <laughs> again, this is just some collaboration across uh, multiple different people. What do you want to do? See? This is basically a simple doing a request against the, uh, against your URL, looking for saying re uh, regex is coming back, doing a, sorry, doing a login against the application, looking for a regex back. So this took a lot of back and forth with Google Chrome and, and the dev tools that are in that. And I was able to figure out that when we do a successful login, we get a secure session token. So the, hey, that's a success. If we don't get this, we get hit to a maintenance page. And it's a fail. So, it is time. so that created this first dashboard. And I was like, great. So it's like we have something now. Our operations teams can kind of look at this. So I put this out to pasture, see what people taught. And everyone said, this is great. This is something that we can use. It's automation. We don't do the verification. This test runs every 30 seconds. So we have this instant view. This is all running at AWS on a micro instance. This is great. Then it was like, well, once I go to this page and that's already read, what happens? I was like, okay, that's you know, valid question. So now I started thinking, what about history view? What about testing from multiple locations? Because this test was running in a single region on a single instance. As it was just a POC. So then that kind of led me to think, okay, we need to have better time series and we need to be able to get around false positives. So then as taking a business standpoint of looking at, you know, what do we support internally from a time series database? So InfluxDB is something, and um, Prometheus is you know, something we're moving towards at the time. So again, looking at InfluxDB, um, I took a lot of time on trying to figure it out, and trying to figure out how we could port my Python script, well, Python script we were working with at the time into InfluxDB. This would have meant that we had to redesign the whole uh, script and trying to get that information into InfluxDB. It was it was just becoming very time consuming. So I said, okay, Prometheus is something that we were moving towards. Victor's done a couple of talks of this before, so I'm not going to go into the details of it. But for me, Prometheus, when I got into it, was able to provide the time series database that I was looking for. And also, it, I still had the same problem in trying to port the Python script into it. But after talking with some people in the community, I found out that Prometheus has a solution called Black Box Exporter. So Prometheus, is like has this kind of master-slave relationship. So you have these exporters which are like the slave. Prometheus is asking the exporters to run tests against. And I'm not going to repeat what the black box exporter is. It's there in, in, in words. But basically, I was able to produce a similar test to what I was doing in the Python script with Prometheus. And this is kind of like what it looks like the exporter. So I can have multiple exporters running in multiple regions and a single Prometheus uh, collector. Um, with time. So this is kind of so for me, Prometheus was easy to understand when it came to configuration files. It's all built in YAML, and there's a couple of points kind of just kind of highlight. So the bit that we kind of care about is well, not care about the most important bits was the scrape configuration. So the module needs to be the same as what's on the black box exporter, and then we give it a target, which is a static target for us, it's the URL and the login page, and then also we point it towards the black box exporter. Blackbox Explorer, again, simple configuration file, YAML, built in YAML. Again, highlighting that we have this same module name. It's going to run a probe, which is HTTP, and in the back end, it has, it's looking for like uh, 200 codes. It has all these built-in tests into it. But for me, I was looking for the regex. 
So again, going back to testing against what the Workday application does. So this all worked. We were able to run it. We said, hey, this is the Prometheus uh, front end. It's like, hey, ones are good, zeros are bad. This is all good. So now I was like, okay, how my operations team is going to be able to look at this or somebody that's actually making a change or validation? I think this isn't easy to kind of, it's not, it's not nice in the eyes. So, so let's make it pretty. So let's stick a Grafana on top of that. So again, this is a Grafana dashboard, all open source, you know, and then taking what the Prometheus, pointing out the Prometheus collector, I was able to produce these kind of tiles, and green is good, obviously, ones are good, and now I have my time series database represented in front. So the, the reason for the multiple regions is, again, my, one region might have a problem, Amazon might have a problem, the instance might have a problem, so we don't want to create these false positives. If all three reasons go down, then we have a problem, it's definitely down. So again, this is a simple kind of open source tooling that you know, we're able to pull together. It's so efficient uh, for us now that it's used across all the other organization as a part of our validation testing. So again, this test is running every 30 seconds. Uh, we're able to know after change, within a 30 second window, whether it's broke the application or the application is still up. So as I said, we can either build or buy so how, did this, how much does this cost us per month running in Amazon, multiple regions? It worked out $40 a month. So again, compared to what we could have used with another vendor, this was saving us massive amounts. And to 2,000 eyes, so <laughs> um, I'll, do, I'll give a brief intro and then Daniela will jump on this. So again, a simple idea, and this is what hopefully the base of this talk is kind of looking towards. So this idea came from um, talking with uh, another principal engineer in here. He sent me this on Slack one day. I was like, is that right, it's a trace root tool? He's like, no, yeah, it is, but I can also see the ASs. I was like, this is interesting. This looks very familiar to a tool that we buy from a vendor. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So I like to make things pretty. I sat there, how do I make this pretty? Daniel. So. <laughs> So myself and Danny and worked on an internal hackathon together and we both kind of liked visuals. And so I approached Danny, and I told him about the tool which is layer four trace route. Um, I gave him the output and I said, I think we can make this pretty. And Danny will take it from here. So yeah, uh, I was there running my business and then this man came over and was like, you know, this, this beautiful layer four trace route shows you a lot of information but it looks ugly like we can't really look at those thousand lines every time and try to figure out. So should try to visualize that in a better way. And uh, so we started looking at what was out there, already available. And uh, we went to uh, Apache Superset, which is a beautiful uh, tool. If you use that, if you have a lot of data, you should use it. And uh, trying to see if we could use that to visualize uh, all the, uh, our uh, routes and uh, all the different paths that the packets uh, took from our probes uh, to the Corte uh, data centers. That was the first attempt. Looks nice, uh, but doesn't like loops. Uh, the graph itself is not designed for loops. And uh, you know, you said PGP, there's loops all over the way, so that's definitely not a good tool. Uh, so uh, we kept looking around and figured out that the good people at Netflix came up with this uh, JavaScript library. It's called it's for our clients. And it's uh, a library that is designed to show uh, complex networks. Uh, it, uh, it's JSON and spit out this beautiful uh, stuff. So uh, it was created uh, by the Chaos team at uh, Netflix. And it's, uh, in the beginning, they just show a few videos on YouTube uh, just to show how good it was. But then they decided to open source the library itself. Uh, it's nice, uses uh, WebGL on your browser, so it's actually heavy on the browser, but that's easy on the backend. It's nice. Uh, set ping is not maintained anymore because Netflix is not using that uh, anymore, but the code is there. It's uh, open source on GitHub, so there's a bunch of people actually keeping the project uh, kind of alive. Uh, so, how to translate uh, layer for trace root as this uh, XML output, which is easier to parse than the standard output, but still ugly. And uh, this thing had to be translated in the visitor JSON input, which is even uglier. And uh, uh, yeah, the JSON schema is just madness, it's huge. And, uh, but that's the structure there, so uh, figure out, we can do this. The idea was to uh, start a bunch of probes uh, around the globe and different AWS regions. 
uh, have them running layer flow trace route against us and collect all this output from uh, uh, LFT and put them somewhere in S3 bucket and then having this parser just parsing files and speaking of JSON and uh, we could then probably visualize that. Looks easy, kind of. Uh, so we started doing that and uh, uh, it was like how to implement actually this. The probe itself uh, needed to do a few things. Uh, run the uh, trace route, grab the XML, translate to the shared uh, JSON, and push that to S3, and then the parser had to grab all the different uh, trace, put them together in a bigger graph, and uh, lay them somewhere for the uh, web app uh, to actually be rendered. How to write this? Uh, I was thinking since it was a uh, period that was learning growth, like why not? Uh, there are so many languages, they are all the same, so they go, uh, I went with yeah. And uh, it was actually doable. Uh, the most annoying thing was to define all the data structure inside between the piece of JSON and the uh, XML, but eventually got something uh, together that seems to work. So this design uh, needed a lot of virtual machines in different data centers with a lot of VPCs and networks and connection. Uh, to deploy all of this, uh, since I'm a big Ashcorp uh, fanboy, uh, I went with Packer and Terraform. Uh, so using Packer to build uh, AMIs with all the software inside, all the config and Terraform to actually deploy that uh, across uh, AWS regions. And yeah, there's some uh, screenshot of uh, Parker actually building uh, images and pushing them in 14 regions, and then uh, oh, I that, so. uh, this is the Terraform code actually to deploy them uh, in uh, auto scaling groups, uh, and it works uh, and it's actually fast. It takes yeah two minutes ish to deploy everything. Uh, this is like really really cool. But, yeah. <laughs> I love this. Uh, the hardest part was, of course, the UI. Uh, the Visual Web App is, uh, uses React, and uh, the, the one that we, we started with was uh, stolen uh, from the GitHub example that on the uh, GitHub page. And it's uh, UI, it's art. I don't know if you ever had to deal with UI, but like all this backend uh, networking, that's easy. Like drawing a square in a place and screen is madness. <laughs> like it's really, I spent more time trying to get the uh, UI to show the graph that actually generating this JSON. It's really, that's, that's, that's like, I respect a lot of UI engineers. <laughs> the JavaScript itself is a beautiful language, but also drives you crazy. Uh, because there's a bunch of calls that call themselves, that keep calling themselves, and you don't know where you are. And so it was hard, but eventually uh, we got something together, and it seems to work. Uh, test demo, if it works. <laughs> get there. <clears throat> Sacrificed. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's sure. Uh, once. Oh, so many cables. Yeah, standards. Uh, which one? This one? This one. Oh, this one I like, yeah. Okay. Get some more full screen. Hopefully it's still running. Still running? Yeah. It's running. Come look at what's Oh, there's a way, there's a way, drum roll. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, it will hold it up. I guess it takes time. Yeah, even this. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay, ah, I think I've seen Then you can look at the small screen. Uh, well, when this hey, thing hey, blocked hey, eventually. Hey, yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, yeah. 
<laughs> works. <laughs> and yeah, it looks super cool. Like you, you don't know what's going on there, but it looks yeah. nice. Like. <laughs> Even the thing red, I don't care. It's red. It's beautiful. It's, uh, so yeah, uh, this is the main view. So there are 62 probes around, running LST, and they collect the stuff. And then the, it, that's like uh, roughly one minute uh, delay uh, because S3 takes one minute to actually uh, be consistent. And I don't use any fancy queuing system. Just write on a string and wait for a string to show up the data. And if you go around, you can actually go inside and look what's going on inside. So there are all the different. Uh, Sources there and the path they're going through. You can see there's this guy in here. Uh, so slow, 200 milliseconds. Okay, you. And uh, uh, you can, of course, uh, see uh, the direct connection between the nodes. Uh, so you can filter them uh, based on IP addresses and that kind of stuff. See if a few of them are detecting filters. The UI did some improvements. Uh, we are thinking to actually group the nodes by. Uh, AS because there's a uh, few paths that are like too many, you can't figure out. Even if you know that something's broken, it's too much. And uh, so the, the next version probably will group the nodes based on autonomous systems just so uh, it's easier to look at them, yeah, to visualize. Uh, but still, like this, on this screen, it looks super cool, it's beautiful, like it's huge. And uh, that's the thing, pretty much. Uh, you can see all the sources here, there are different regions for where the probes are running. And yeah, uh, from Asia is lower because we are pointing this one probably somewhere in the west coast and uh, going around. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that was the thing, yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, so the code is not open source yet, but we were thinking to push that out because yeah, there's something really related to work in here. Anyone, you can point that to anything. Uh, we're pointing to our URL, but it's. Uh, just a random uh, probe. And also, so someone that knows why better than me maybe can fix this because it's. Thank you. Thank you. Last two, that was nice. <laughs> yeah.